Good evening. It's great to see all of you here. It's time for, uh, for us to begin our devotional, and then we'll have our Bible classes uh, after the devotional tonight, but we're really glad to see all of you here. Uh, Willie Smith is going to be extending the invitation tonight, and uh, Jeff Leslie is going to be leading us in our family prayer. So before Willie comes and speaks to us, we're going to sing a couple verses of Zion's call, uh, number 800. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea. Joseph Bedrotti was an outstanding high school athlete from Fairway, Kansas, who won numerous state championship awards in basketball and football, was a standout student at the University of Missouri majoring in mechanical engineering, according to his obituary. Joe was always loving, kind, humble, patient, self-assured, funny, and hardworking, his obituary says, noting he was an organ donor and four different people received his organs. Many of us find it easier to do the right thing when others are watching. However, Joe was the person who did the right thing when no one was watching, his obituary says. He loved his friends and cherished all the time he spent with them. Around midnight several weeks ago, during spring break vacation, college senior Joseph Pedrotti and some friends gathered together at the pool at their hotel in Panama City Beach. Pedrotti was betting he could hold his breath long enough to go around the perimeter of an island within the pool at Spring Hill Suites. About a minute after Pedrotti entered the water, his friend spotted the 21-year-old floating face down unconscious. They pulled him out and started CPR before police and rescue workers took over, according to police who arrived on the scene shortly after midnight on March the 30th. Pedrotti was rushed to a hospital in critical condition, and on April 2nd, he died of a deadly and little-known condition called shallow water blackout, according to his obituary. Please educate yourself and others about the cause of Joe's death, shallow water blackout, at shallowwaterblackoutprevention.org, and help save someone's life, according to his obituary. Shallow water blackout is an underwater faint caused by holding your breath continuously for a long time underwater. The body is starved of oxygen and decreased carbon dioxide levels cause the brain to block the signal to breathe, causing a swimmer to faint underwater with no other symptoms or awareness of a need to breathe, according to the site. Drowning is silent and immediate and is the major cause of drowning death in experienced swimmers, according to Dr. Alan Lake in a PSA video on the website. Michael Phelps and his coach, Bob Bowman, also take part in the public service announcement. At greatest risk of shallow water blackout are accomplished swimmers at the end of a training session. Swimmers attempting an underwater swim who are oftentimes competing to see who can go the furthest in swimmers who are alone. Because the swimmer has a low level of oxygen at the time of fainting, brain damage occurs within a couple of minutes and death is very likely unless immediate resuscitation is undertaken, says Lake. Bowman and the site give tips on how to prevent shallow water blackout. 
One, never swim alone and never ignore the urge to breathe while underwater. Never repeatedly hold your breath as repetitive breath holding increases the risk. Never compete with other swimmers to see who can swim the furthest underwater or play underwater ho uh, breath holding games. Don't attempt long or repetitive underwater swims or kicks for any reason. Only perform underwater training under the guidance of a certified swim coach. If hyperventilating, never start an underwater swim or kicks. The site also urges pool owners to post signs that ban breath holding drills and games. If you know tonight that you're not saved or you're unsure, or if you know you need to publicly repent and you choose not to respond to the Lord's invitation tonight, then I pray that I've just said something that could possibly save your life one day in order that you might respond to Jesus the next time he's asking to save your soul. That invitation is made with the gospel. Believing that Jesus is who he, the God of heaven, and all of the Bible says he is. The Christ, the son of the living God. Then repent. Change your understanding, change your knowledge, change your dependence on sin. Turn all of your heart to the commandments of God and walk in the principles of Christ. The Bible says that you must confess. Communicate what dominates your heart. What fills your heart. That faith, that belief that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was crucified, he was buried, and in three days he was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven and he sits right now at the side of God, preparing to judge the world. And then you allow yourself to be baptized. Allow your sins to be completely washed away with the blood of Jesus. Be immersed for the remission of all of those sins to be raised up a new creature and added to the church by the Lord himself. And then the Bible says to live and just stay faithful. Be full of faith. If you're on line tonight, and you need to respond to this invitation, please, I encourage you, contact the elders. If you don't know how to contact the elders, contact the office, contact the preachers, contact the deacons. In fact, if you need to respond, please contact any member of this congregation and they will help you get in touch with the eldership. I'm not sure if the American journalist, Norman Cousins, has the same understanding of the soul as we do. But in his quote, I'm going to use our understanding of the soul. In his quote, he says, death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss in life is that which dies within us while we live. Think about your soul. If you're online and you need to respond to this, we're going to stand in a few moments and sing a song of invitation. During the singing of that invitation song, forward that request, forward that need to the eldership. If you're here and you need to respond to this invitation, come forward during the singing of the invitation song. Let us all stand and sing.
Please be seated. We are at this time going to have our family prayer. If you filled out one of these blue prayer request cards that we keep on that back table, if you will hold that up uh, at this time so that the ushers can see those, and uh, they will bring those up, and we will include, uh, include those in our prayer tonight. Dan McLeod, it is good to see you back uh, safely, and uh, thank you for all that you did and uh, teaching out in the South Pacific with Robert Martin over the last several weeks, and uh, thankful that you are uh, back home safely. There are a number of our members that, uh, that we know of that we need to continue to be praying for. Uh, Adrian Banks has, uh, uh, is still in ICU at Wellington Regional. She had a biopsy done yesterday uh, of her lung, and uh, they are still doing some tests to try to figure out exactly what's going on with her. Uh, and So uh, just a lot of things, and uh, it's uh, stressful for Jimmy as well. So keep both of them in your prayers. Uh, Johnny Mark Davis has begun uh, last week a, a two-month uh, chemo treatment for his kidney cancer, and uh, he's going to undergo that two-month treatment and then uh, uh, reevaluate after that. Uh, Loretta Holliday had uh, her hip replacement surgery yesterday and is recovering from that, uh, and John Jordan had a back procedure done today. Uh, we mentioned on Sunday that Grace Judge uh, had been in the hospital. She is now at home, uh, but uh, still recovering uh, from the things that uh, transpired that led her to the hospital, and uh, so keep her in your prayers. Robert Mariano is uh, being treated for skin cancer again. Uh, as you know, that's uh, been several times that he's uh, dealt with that, uh, and so he asked today that we be praying for him tonight. Uh, Les Sawyer is at home but is uh, very weak. Uh, we also need to be uh, praying for Mike Archer, who is uh, in the Addington, undergoing rehab on his knee. Uh, Jackie Creary uh, had uh, one eye surgery, cataract surgery, last week, uh, and she's got the next one uh, next week, and so continue to remember her. Teresa Williams is recovering from surgery on her hand, uh, and Glenn Dawson is uh, scheduled for a cardiac ablation on June 1st. Uh, as you may recall, he was uh, scheduled to have that surgery uh, several months ago, and uh, ended up having a number of complications, and it's just now that they're able to reschedule that for him. Uh, so Glenn is looking forward to having that surgery and hopefully uh, getting through it and uh, being being back to where he wants to be. Annie Faison is still under hospice care uh, down at her daughter's home in Miami. Um, Nicole Friesman asked us to be praying for Cheryl Ann Weiniger. Says she has a bad migraine, um, and so uh, not having a good day at all as a result of that. So uh, let's keep Cheryl Ann in our prayers. She's been having a number of struggles uh, recently. June Pack asked us to be praying for her son, Bobby Haynes, uh, who a lot of us know he is facing his fourth spinal surgery uh, very soon and is just in a lot of uh, pain. We mentioned on Sunday about uh, Ed and Jeannie Bonadonna's daughter, Kayla Bonadonna, that she was in the hospital. Uh, she was able to go home on Sunday evening and is now back at home, but uh, still in need of our prayers. Uh, Mary Brown asked us to pray for her brother, uh, Ulysses Smith. Uh, he is undergoing chemo for leukemia, and he is not doing well. Um, Julie Charles asked us to pray for a couple co-workers. Um, one is Diana Gardner. Uh, she was diagnosed with cancer, and she is out for the rest of the school year. Uh, Julie also asked us to pray for a co-worker and friend named Michael, uh, he is leaving Monday for uh, basic training uh, in the Army. Um, and then uh, Robert Lupo asked us to pray for a translator friend of his. Uh, his name is Khalil Safan. He lives over in Palestine. And uh, Khalil let Babo know about a uh, number of things that are happening there with all of the bombing that is going on. And he is right there living through that uh, with all of the bombing that's happening there in Palestine and so Babo told Khalil uh, that we would be including him and his family uh, in our prayer tonight. Jeff I think that's everything that we've had turned in tonight. Let's bow together and pray as Jeff comes to lead us. Will you bow with me please? Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father how thankful we are dear Lord to know that we can call you our Father, and to know, dear Lord, that you're concerned about each and every one of us as your children. Father, what a great gift it is and tremendous blessing that you would allow us to speak directly to you and 
petition you with those things that we have need of and and also to uh, thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Truly, how great you are and how thankful we are that uh, we know of you and that uh, we know how we can seek you. Father, tonight we pray that uh, you'll be with uh, those who've been mentioned tonight, several who are going through great difficulties and sicknesses and having life-changing events. Father, we pray that you will be there with them and help them. Lord, be with Adrian Banks, who's been through so many things lately. I pray that you'll help her to have confidence and strength and courage and uh, to be long-suffering and working uh, and enthusiastic towards uh, recovery. We pray that you'll bless all those who are dealing with her. Father, we pray also for Johnny Mark Davis. What a very difficult thing to be dealing with cancer in his kidneys. And Lord, we are so thankful for his desire and recognition to come back to you and to be a part of your church. Uh, And dear Lord, we pray that you'll strengthen him and be with those who are tending to him and help them to give him the, the best care there is so that he might uh, be able to recover and and be back with us here again someday soon. Be with uh, Loretta Holliday and John Jordan and Grace Judge and Robert Mariano. Be with Les Sawyer and Mike Archer and Jackie Crary, Teresa Williams, Glenn Dawson, Cheryl Ann Weiniger, Lord, you, uh, you know what their needs are. You know everything about them. And Lord, we just pray you'll be there for them. Help them to their faith to grow through this time of weakness and, and despair. But also allow them to get the best treatments and, and care possible. Comfort them. Be with them. Help them to recognize and know that you are present with them. And Father, we pray that you will be able to return them soon to their much-wanted health. Lord, I also want to pray for Annie Faison, who's having such a difficult time under hospice. Dear Lord, it's uh, such a tough thing. Dear Lord, we pray that you will be with her and her family and help them to lean on the faith that they have built and that you support and that you have told us that when times are difficult, that you've given us our faith. And we pray, dear Lord, that you will help them through this most difficult time by relying on that faith that you've, you provide us and helped us with, to, to grow. Dear Lord, we pray you'll be with uh, Bobby Haynes and Kayla Buenadonna and Khalil Safon and Ulysses Smith and Diana Gardner. Again, friends or family of those who are members here at this place. We pray, dear Lord, that they will, uh, you will be there for them and help them. Help us, dear Lord, to also be there for them and for all those who are sick. Let us make sure we take time, we continue to pray, we continue to serve them and their families. Help them to, help us to have the zeal and the energy to support them. <coughs> Dear Lord, um, be with Michael, uh, Julie, uh, Charles' co-worker, and uh, help him as he's leaving for basic training for the Army. We pray, dear Lord, that you will (coughs) help him to be safe and return him home safely and watch over him. Forgive us all our sins, dear Lord. Bless us and keep us. Give us long, healthy, happy lives. And a home with you in the end. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, it is great to see everybody here tonight. What a, what a relief and a joy it is to, uh, to just be together and to uh, spend some time together in the middle of the week and uh, studying the Bible together. And we'll head to our Bible classes in just a minute. But we would like to ask at least one member from each family, if you could, 
grab one of those cards that's there in the back of the pew in front of you and uh, take just a minute uh, to fill out the side of that card that's a design for you. If you're a guest here tonight, we are really glad that you are here. Uh, it seems like every service we always have those who are visiting with us, and we are really glad that you do that. And uh, if you could just help us out by uh, letting us know that you're here, uh, just filling out that card, and uh, the members will fill out the other side, and you can leave them there uh, on the pew where you're sitting, and those will get picked up after our services tonight. Uh, just a reminder uh, that out in the lobby there are some flyers for the uh, seminar that will be taking place a week from this Friday, so in nine days, uh, Dr. Jeff Miller from Apologetics Press will be here uh, to, conduct a, uh, to conduct a seminar uh, that's called Christians Can Be Confident About Creation. And uh, you will be blessed to be a part of that, I know, and uh, your friends and family members will be as well. And so just let's, let's invite as many folks as we can We're using those flyers, using uh, our website, our Facebook page, and the information that's out there. Uh, this is, uh, if, there's any, if there's anything that's, any topic that's needed right now, uh, it is that our nation needs God and an understanding that God made all things, uh, including us. And so let's, uh, let's make this as widely known as we can. Keep Jeff in your prayers and plan to be here uh, yourself as well. Um, tonight, uh, we do have our regular classes taking place here in the auditorium. Uh, Dan will be uh, continuing his study of the minor prophets uh, over in the family room. Dan Fuller will be uh, continuing his study of the historicity of Jesus. And then there is a ladies class down in adult one and two. Uh, that a variety of uh, ladies are teaching, uh, rotating each night and teaching those lessons on some women from the book of Genesis. So uh, you've got those classes to choose from tonight. Let's enjoy uh, studying together as we head to our classes tonight. All right, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, David, how many more weeks, how many more Wednesday nights do we have to, st to study these books? You know when it ends? I don't know, too. Okay. We're, in, we're down to the final four books, by the way, and I just want to make sure. Now, one of them has 14 chapters, and so we'll not, obviously, we'll not cover that 14-chapter uh, that book of Zechariah because it has much of the imagery of the book of Revelation. And so to understand some of the things uh, uh, in uh, Zechariah is to understand them in, uh, 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 understand them in Revelation. You may not, you, you've got to know Zephaniah, or it really helps to know Zephaniah to help you understand the, uh, uh, that book. Last week we did not finish the study of, uh, of Habakkuk, I, uh, really of two minds about whether to just try to jump right back in in the middle of it and try to catch us up, and then I thought, that's not fair to, uh, uh, to us in relationship to this. So I want us tonight to go to that next book, the book of Zephaniah. If you look in Zephaniah and look in the first verse, you'll see the name Josiah. Now, I hope you know about where Josiah fits in the Bible. You've got Hezekiah, great and great and godly king, trusted in the Lord and was used by God over and over again to accomplish some mighty, mighty works. God worked through him and worked that miracle when in one night he told uh, uh, Hezekiah, don't you worry about this Assyrian army. Uh, they, uh, they won't even shoot an arrow into this city. The Assyrian army had just taken the northern kingdom and, uh, and they've come down to take that southern kingdom and the Lord tells uh, uh, Hezekiah, don't you even worry about it. Now, can you imagine that? Uh, he comes down and he surrounds the city of Jerusalem. And the Lord says, Hezekiah, don't you worry. Don't you worry about it. Uh, 
he, uh, they will not shoot one single arrow in the, into this city. And furthermore, the king who is leading this will, will go back home and he'll die a miserable death back in his home. That is, a, is an amazing uh, uh, part of all of this. And so I think it's important that we, that we, we get the historical background because all of these books, you know, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and Haggai, uh, well, Zephaniah, uh, 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 well, at least Habakkuk and Zephaniah live just as that northern kingdom is, or pardon me, as, the southern, as, as Nebuchadnezzar is coming to wipe out the city of Jerusalem. I, I would encourage you to file away in your mind how often Babylon is mentioned in the Bible. They're all the way through it. I mean, it begins at the Tower of Babel, which means confusion, and that's where the city of Babylon was established, at the Tower of Babel. Remember how God confused their language and did all of that. But Babylon is a really a remarkable, insignificant kingdom. I mean, you think about the number of years that Syria was such a dominating power. And Assyria, how many years was it a dominating power? And then you get, you get beyond that, you get to the kingdom of the Medes and Persia, and that kingdom lasts over 200 years. You get to Alexander the Great, and while it is great, while Alexander is alive, when you get to that intertestinal minute period, you know, you've got, uh, you've got nearly 300 years there. Where, uh, there, where there is that influence of the Greek world. Babylon exists only for 70 years. Now it had existed all the way from the Tower of Babel. But whenever you have all of these world kingdoms and the divided kingdom, you've got Syria, where's Babylon? They're just a little, little tiny nation. And whenever Assyria becomes so dominant, where's Babylon? It's a little tiny nation. But God made sure that His people and that the world knew that though Babylon was going to destroy the Jews, God was going to bring judgment against Babylon in a remarkable way. 200 years almost before Babylon, before, uh, uh, Babylon reaches its ascendancy, Isaiah writes about Babylon. And he, Babylon's not a great power when he writes about it. It's an insignificant nation, but it's not a powerful nation. You don't have anything to worry about Babylon. It's rather interesting, talking about that point, whenever Hezekiah had, that, had his life extended, you remember how many years God added to his life? It was 15 years God added to Hezekiah, righteous Hezekiah. God said, you're going to die, set your house in order. And he prayed and God gave him another 15 years. During that time, Babylon sent, sent messengers all the way from Babylon to Jerusalem to congratulate uh, uh, Hezekiah for getting well. And when Isaiah said, who are these men? Why are they here? And he says, they are from a far away country. That's what Babylon was. And yet during that 70 year period, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar, General Nebuchadnezzar, then King Nebuchadnezzar, during that 70 year period of time, you had Babylon as it was growing up and becoming more and more powerful. Through Isaiah, 200 years before Babylon reaches its ascendancy, the Lord says that Babylon, the glory of the Chaldees' excellency. Chaldea, Ur of Chaldees, that's where they were. You know, uh, it, will, uh, it will be decimated, and uh, the Arabian will not even want to come and pitch his tent in that place. And though, so while God allowed Babylon to reach ascendancy in the prophets, he talks so much about the sins of Babylon. And that's where we were last week in Habakkuk. And, and it's, in, it's in the closing chapters of Jeremiah, which we are not studying. But God talks a lot about the sins of Babylon. Now, when we get to Zephaniah, we get to a minor prophet, minor in the sense that uh, his book is one of the smaller books. We talk about the, 
the five books of the major prophets, and lo and behold, Lamentation only has three or four chapters, and so it's made a major prophet book. But uh, uh, you, it, we, 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 have, we have one of these minor prophets, and Zephaniah is living at the time of Josiah. Now, where does Josiah fit? Hezekiah, great and godly king. When he dies, a son that was born during that 15-year period of time. Sometimes you can live too long. This, this evil king Manasseh would have never been born if, if uh, Hezekiah had died. Hezekiah prayed, extend my life, extend my life, and God heard him, and the worst mistake he had, uh, the, the, the impact of the, the, those 15 years was a king called Manasseh. For 55 years, I want you to think, what year was 55 years ago? Was that, would have been, anybody do, do that math in your head? Would it have been the 70s or would it have been the 80s? Think about how 50, what's changed in the last, uh, uh, in, 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 in the last 50 years. You may go back even uh, farther than that. 20 and then 30 would be the 70s, I guess. But, uh, so he dies God is forgotten. There are idols set up in the temple. They're worshiping the idols inside the temple. And uh, uh, it, it's remarkable the things that are transpiring. His son gets on the throne. His son is Amon. He only reigns two years, but he continues doing what his father did. Now you've got to, to recognize that when Josiah, the son of Amon, comes on the scene, he does not immediately become a righteous king. He is a boy king. And so he's some, uh, depending on uh, uh, whether you're reading the Kings or the Chronicles, he uh, uh, is several years into his reign and they discover a Bible. And that's when they restore Judaism during the time of Josiah. Guess who? grew up during that time when Josiah was there for about those 15 good years. If I say Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego, it is remarkable that you've got, you've got you know, 57 years of Amon and those early years of Josiah when he was, before he ever finds the Bible. You've got nearly 70 years involved in that, and then all of a sudden you've got a 15-year period of time. And that's when Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where does their faith come from? Think about all you know about those three Hebrew children. Now, after Josiah dies, the kingdom exists for another 22 years, a little over 22 years, before Nebuchadnezzar comes and, and destroys Jerusalem. What's life like in Judah at that time? You see, it's not that God just has Habakkuk talking about Babylon. It's not just that he has Jeremiah talking about Babylon. Zephaniah comes on the scene. The, the first verse says, The word of the Lord which came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushai, the son of Gedaliah, the son of Amariah, the son of Hezekiah. He's got good, he's got good blood, at least get back to Hezekiah. In the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah. And so he turns his attention, not to Babylon, but to have going on. Do you know why God destroyed that southern kingdom? You're about to learn. We're about to read three chapters that describe the, the uh, sins that are going on in that place. Because you see, when Josiah dies... They revert back to that, 70, to, to, to that 70 year period where they've got idols and everything all over the temple grounds and everything. And so God sends a prophet called Zephaniah. His name means either Jehovah has hidden or Jehovah has treasured. And uh, he, uh, he lives just before the end of Jerusalem. Here's God's message to Jerusalem. Not Babylon, not to these pagan nations. God says to Judah, 
I will consume everything from the face of the earth, says Jehovah. I will consume man and beast, consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the land. It's coming. If Zephaniah is proclaiming the message right at the end of the reign of Josiah, 25 years from the time he, uh, you know, he, uh, he begins writing this, approximately 25 years, if, he, if he's prophesying when it had become so evil, the Lord said, I am going to come and I'm not going to leave anybody on this land. And that's what happened. They took the choices of the young men and they transported others uh, with them. They decimated, they destroyed the temple, they destroyed Solomon's temple, they got the Ark of the Covenant, they got the, all of the furniture that was in the temple. They got every bit of that and carried it to Babylon. But the Lord used Zephaniah not to talk about Babylon. You've got to understand the clarity of this message and the impact that God intended for it to have. It is poetic whenever you start talking about the birds and the fish and, the, and, and the, these others. Verse 4 identifies how we know he's talking about Judah, about that southern kingdom. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. See that word all? You remember how Elijah felt? Elijah was up in that northern kingdom and when he has the contest at Mount Carmel, he said, I'm the only righteous person left on this earth. And you read this and you look at how corrupt a nation can become from the height of unbelievable spirituality and devotion to the Lord during the time of Josiah. You've got to understand what happened. They found that Bible and they restored Judaism down to the very feast days and, and they restored it in, in, uh, in its entirety. And now 25 years later, the Lord said, I'm wiping Jerusalem out. Now you and I know that he said, you'll be 70 years in Babylon. But the Lord is angry with Jerusalem. I will cut off every trace of Baal, the idol, from this place. And I will cut off the names of the idolatrous priest with the pagan priest. Judgment's coming. And this is God's message from his prophet trying to, to shake up the Jews enough to get them to change their lives. There are times when you as a parent have done this very same thing. There are times in which you try to use loving kindness and tenderness to get them to live right and to do right. But that time comes when that child needs to learn you're not going to get away with insolence and disobedience and lack of respect for authority. Now, if you want to know why America's in the shape it's in, we've got two, the last two generations was raised at a time when there was almost no discipline in the home. And if a child got in trouble, mom and dad hired a lawyer to get them off. They did what the politicians do, you understand. But the child's not responsible and he grows up totally irresponsible. And so the, so, so the Lord says, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to destroy this nation. He talks about the priest, about pagan priests and those uh, idolatrous priests who evidently were priests in, uh, in Jerusalem, Judea, very likely Levitical priests, if you make a distinction between the, those who worship Baal and uh, uh, the pagans and the idolatrous uh, priest. And then he says in verse 5, I am coming against those who worship the host of heavens. What did ancient man worship? You <laughs> acquainted with the, uh, astronomy at all? You know, the zodiac that's up there has many of the gods of paganism in it. Do you know that there are individuals in America who believe your horoscope is all that matters? If you're born in a particular month, 
then you must marry somebody from the, another month or your marriage is in trouble. It just, it just never, ever will work out. But they worship the stars. They worship Mercury. They worship Jupiter. Was that not the name of their chief god in the, in the Roman world? Zeus in the Greek world, but Jupiter in the Roman world. They looked at the planets and they worshiped the planets. And the Lord says, I am against those who worship the hosts of heaven on their housetops. <coughs> those who worship and swear oaths by the Lord, who also swear by Milcom, another one of the names of one of the gods. Those who have turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of Him. Does that sound like America? Does that sound like America? If in a discussion with your friends, you try to say, do you know what the Bible says about this? They immediately want to end that conversation. They don't have any desire to, to inquire of the Lord about any of these things. And then he says, They've turned back from following the Lord and have not sought the Lord nor inquired of Him. When you get to verse 7, you get to an Old Testament expression, the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is an expression found in the Old Testament some 20 times. And it was always a judgment day. Uh, you know, in fact, with the exception of, of one place, uh, we universally understand that. That is, the day of the Lord was a judgment day. It's Old Testament terminology that individuals would readily recognize. And so he says, Be silent in the presence of the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's coming. 25 years from the end of Josiah's reign, this, the uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to some and come and start tearing down the city. For the Lord has prepared a sacrifice, and He has invited His guests. Guess who His guests are? The nations, the evil people in the nation, and the implication is, you have become the sacrifice. A great, powerful play on words here. The day of the Lord is going to be a day of sacrifice, and it shall be in the day of the Lord's sacrifice. I will punish the princes and the king's children and all of those who are clothed with, far, with, with foreign apparel. How worldly had they become? The Lord says, I am going to come and in the day of the Lord's sacrifice, even the children of the king will be a part of that sacrifice. Now, I'm not talking about human sacrifice. I'm just talking about when the wrath of God comes, it's going to be brought upon them. In the same day, verse 9, I will punish all of those who leap over the threshold. What's that all about? I believe it's in Exodus, it could be Leviticus. But there's a description of, of how when the priests were serving God, when they came to the threshold, they would not step their foot down on the threshold. They would, in the, they would leap over the threshold. It was a part of their religious ceremony. You ever step on a crack and break your grandmother's back? <laughs> That's not what we're talking about when we're talking about leaping over the threshold, but isn't that ironic? And so he says, in, instead of step, stepping on the threshold, they're going to be like the pagans, and I'm going to punish every one of them that does it. As insignificant a thing as jumping over the threshold. Why? Because that identifies me with evil and identifies me with that which is ungodly. Those who leap over the threshold, who fill their master's house with violence and deceit. 
And there shall be on that day, says the Lord, weeping and wailing. Can you imagine? When Nebuchadnezzar comes and, and uh, uh, starts tearing down Jerusalem, he came three different times. And, and when he came and surrounded the city, look at the death that was inside. It's the sound of a mournful cry, and he mentions a geographical place, the fish gate and the second quarter, and a loud crashing from the hills. Wail, ye inhabitants of Maktish, for all the merchant people are cut down, all those who handle money are cut off. Guess who's in charge of money in our day and also in the first century? It was the Jewish nation. They were the ones who, had, who, who operated uh, uh, the money chain. And so the Lord says, here are those, and by the way, when, when judgment comes, your money is not going to be any good to you. Isn't that amazing? The doctor says you're terminally ill, and there's nothing we can do for you. And you say, I could give you $100,000, cannot do it. 300,000, I cannot do it. Because money cannot, cannot fix every problem, and when the problem is sin, a sin problem. But aren't there people who try to use their money to get on God's side? You know, make a, a visually some great contribution. You remember how Jesus described the Pharisees in their giving? They sounded the trumpet so everybody would notice them when they're giving alms to the others. Does that sound like Hollywood? Where some person in the, in the cinema or in, the, uh, in that kind of industry, well, is going to give a million dollars to feed hungry children. That's the very thing Jesus says you don't do. And the Lord says, the Lord says uh, all those who, 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 who manage money are cut off. And it shall come to pass at that time in the day of the Lord, I will search Jerusalem with a flashlight. What does that mean? Have you ever lost anything at the house? And you think it might be under the bed? Think it might be under a table somewhere? Have you ever taken out your cell phone and turned it into a flashlight and used it to search? The Lord says, I know what's going on there, and I want you to know when I come, I am bringing my lamps. I'm going to search the, the Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Is that graphic? The city is about to be destroyed. And they got all this money and all this prosperity and there is the danger of the Babylonians coming, but they're in complacency. They're not, they're not aware of what's going on. You know the great danger the Lord's church faces today is complacency. You know, in years past, the Lord, the, we struggled and, and uh, even have buildings and everything. Now we've got nice buildings, what do we do? We become complacent and we do that and you can make that application to your home and to, as, uh, to every other aspect of life. Who say in the heart, the Lord will not do good nor will he do evil we are complacent, God is complacent, so let's just live any way we want to, and God, uh, God, will not punish, they, God will not punish us. Therefore, their goods will become the spoils of the city. I mentioned this last week about the word booty. When I used that in a sermon one time, all of the teens up here got, started giggling. Their definition, definition of booty is not the spoils of the city. But he says, look, all of, the, all of these treasures that you got, it will, it will become booty. The houses will become desolation. You'll build houses and you'll plant vineyards, but you'll never be able to live in them or drink, drink uh, the, uh, the wine that comes out of the vineyards. Verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near. And I think it is significant to point out how often this expression, the day of the Lord, is, is found. Every Old Testament usage of it is about a judgment day. Uh, the Bible talks about the final judgment. You remember in 2 Peter chapter 3, where's the promise of His coming? Or Since the, the fathers died, all things continue as they were. The Lord says you're ignorant of, of, of some things. And, and, uh, uh, and, and then He says, 
but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The assurance that God is going to do something in the end on the final day of the Lord is because He did it over and over again in the Old Testament. It was always God's day of judgment. Look how it's described. Distress, devastation, desolation, that's verse 15, darkness and gloom, clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpets and alarms against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Isn't that funny? How sin blinds you? Well, I just don't see anything wrong with that. And he says, they are like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood, blood is poured out like dust and their flesh is like refuse. Then in verse 18 he says, neither their silver nor gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord the day of the Lord's wrath. For the whole land shall be devoured by fire of his jealousy, for he will make speedy riddance of those who dwell in the land. You're sitting there complacent, and you better watch out. The Lord is coming with great speed to bring, to bring judgment against you. Go to chapter 2. The heading in my Bible, and I put it here, is judgment on, on, uh, on Judah's enemy. And that's so the, they will understand that the Lord is going to bring judgment on these other nations, not just Babylon. But look down in verse 4. There's Gaza or Gaza, where the Philistines are. Ashkelon, a Philistine city. Uh, Ashdod, a, a Philistine city. Ekron, I think it's also one. And then you go to, to verse 5. He says, O land of Canaan, land of the Philistines, the Lord is going to bring judgment, not just against Babylon, but against all of these nations. And so when Nebuchadnezzar comes and is wiping out the city, guess what the nations do? They rush to the city where the spoils are. You read, uh, uh, you, 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 you read about the Edomites and how you even stood in the crossroads and when Jews were fleeing from Jerusalem, you grabbed them and turned them over to the Babylonians. That's how evil they were. So there's this assurance. Gather yourself together, yes. Gather together, the undesirable nation. Before the decree is issued, on the day, or the day passes like chaff, before the Lord's fierce anger comes, before the day of the Lord's anger comes upon you, seek the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, who have upheld justice. Seek righteousness, seek humility. It may be that you will be hidden in the day of the Lord's anger. I think it is rather interesting. Uh, in a study I had with Jehovah's Witnesses, I said to them, what must I do to be saved? I thought it was an interesting question. I had no idea how they would respond. And they said, well, it's obvious. What you must do is, is in uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. And I turned over there and see the word LORD in all caps, seek Jehovah. If you want to be saved, you've got to call God by His name Jehovah. And that is God's plan of salvation for the lost. I found that an amazing verse that they summed it all up in that, in that one verse. He says then, Gaza shall be forsaken and desolate. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday and Ekron shall be uprooted. War to the inhabitants over there on the Mediterranean seacoast, the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of the Philistines. I will destroy you so there will be no inhabitants. You've got to understand what Nebuchadnezzar did. He came down, and remember that image of last week of having a fish net and catching all of the, all of the fish he could catch, you know, men, and, and, and they would pull, pull, pull them together and then dump them out on the land. That's the description in, in uh, uh, Habakkuk that we looked at last week. And he says, I will destroy you so there shall be no inhabitants. The seacoast shall be pastures with shelters for shepherds and folds of flock. What happened to the nation of the Philistines? What happened to the nations of Phoenicia? What happened to those powerful nations that were there along the Mediterranean Sea 
And the Lord said, when Nebuchadnezzar comes, he's going to take care of all of you who've been fighting against Jerusalem. And he says, they shall feed their flocks there. No, the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. There's that remnant. There's the godly ones that go over to Babylon in captivity. And when they come back, guess what? They're going to be able to take their sheep down to the coastlands that's there. And you will not have to fear the Philistines or the nations that were there. The coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed their flocks there. And the houses of Ashkelon, they shall lie down at evening. For the Lord God will intervene for them and return his captives, those captives who, were, who are in Babylon. I have heard of the reproach of Moab and the insults of the people of Ammon with which they have reproached my people, the Jews, and made arrogant threats against their borders. Don't you worry, Judah. God's going to take care of all of these enemies. Don't worry about it. Chapter 2, verse 9. As I live, says the Lord, the God of Israel, Moab shall be like Sodom. Where is the nation of Moab now? It does not exist. And the people of Ammon like Gomorrah. What happened to the Moabites and the Edomites and the Ammonites? The Lord said, I am, I am going to overrun them and they will be placed with weeds and salt pits and a perpetual desolation and the residue of my people shall plunder them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. When they come back from Babylon captivity, they're not there. Moabites, Ammonites, they're not there. And so that, that small group that come back from Babylon captivity have access to claim as much of that land as they can use. Uh, the Lord says, I'm doing this because they have pride. They have become, uh, they have become reproached, and make arrogant threats against the people of God, of the Lord's host, against the Jewish nation. The Lord will be awesome to them. He will reduce to nothing all of their gods, people who worship Him, each one in His place, indeed all the shores of the nation. You Ethiopians also, you shall be slain with my sword. And you've got to understand where this is happening. It's happening before they head into Babylon in captivity, and all of these nations that we're reading about are a part of the punishing of the Jews right now when Josiah is preaching, or, or when uh, Zephaniah is preaching. And he says, don't worry about them. When you come back, <coughs> they will not exist. They've been filled with pride. The Lord's going to be awesome to them and reduce them to nothing. The, uh, people who worship Him, Jehovah God, each one in His place, Indeed, all the shores of the nation, you Ethiopians, will also be slain. He will stretch out his hand against the north. Who's up there? Well, has, up there has been Syria, and there is, uh, there is Assyria. I will destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation as the wilderness. The herd shall lie down in her midst, every beast of the nation. The pelican and the bittern shall lodge in the capital of her pillars. Their voices shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be at their threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar wood, cedar work. That's where the, the cedars of Lebanon were. That's up in the north. And, and now then, you've got Nebuchadnezzar that in Babylon, that nothing nation. When he leaves Babylon, guess where he goes first? To Assyria and destroys Assyria in 612 B.C. That's six years before he comes to Jerusalem. He goes over to Tyre and Sidon, and, 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 and when he arrives over there, he, uh, 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 the, he, he destroys Tyre and Sidon, and uh, it's, it's all happening. You think about a 10-year period of time when when Assyria falls and that with Nineveh and when Damascus falls and, and, and when uh, all of these nations are coming out against Jer Jerusalem, he says she has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She's not trusted in the Lord. She's not drawn near to God. Her princes in her are like roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They'll not leave a bone till the morning. Prophets in these cities, insolent, treacherous people, her peace have... Priests have polluted the sanctuary. They've done violence to the law. 
The Lord is righteous in their midst. He will do no unrighteousness. Every morning He'll bring His justice to light. He never fails, but the unjust know no shame. Look at verse 6 of chapter 3. I've cut off the nations. Their fortresses are devastated. Their streets are desolate. Their cities are destroyed. I said, surely will fear, fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling will not be cut off despite everything for which I punished her, but they rose early and corrupted all their deeds. The Lord says, wait, wait for me until the day I rise up in plunder, until the time of the coming of the day of the Lord. My determination is to gather all of these nations and I will pour out my wrath upon all of the uh, 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 upon all of uh, all of the, all of these nations. Verse nine: I will restore the, the the remnant, those who come back from Babylon captivity, to the people of pure language, that they may call on the name of the Lord to serve Him with one accord. Prior to this time, or, or even when they came back. They could not even speak the Jewish language, and they spoke the language of the, of the uh, people of Ashdod. And the Lord put an end to all of that. He says, I'm going beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. I will go there and find my worshipers, and I will bring them that day. And that day you shall not be ashamed of any of your deeds in which you've transgressed them, for I will take away your sins and wipe them out. Verse 13, uh, well, I... Uh, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor deceitful tongues be found in their mouths. And so this prays as the book closes. Because we understand what God is about to do. Sing, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad. Rejoice in your hearts. The Lord's taken away the judgments He's, getting, he's, been, he's made against you. He has cast out your enemy. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said of Jerusalem, Do not fear Zion, nor let your hand be weak. And so they came back from Babylonian captivity, and the, and, and the Lord was with them. Look in verse 19 as we, as we try to cover as much of this as we can. At that time I will deal with all who afflict you. I will save the lame and gather those who were driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they were put to shame. At that time, when I bring the remnant back, even at that time I will gather you, for I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I return your captives from before your eyes. What a great message. It's very graphic in its poetic nature, and yet it tells us so much about the nature of God. You know, you need to understand the most important thing you can ever do it's to serve God. Nothing else matters. Riches and all that gold and silver and all of that fame and all the notoriety they have, it is meaningless, it is hopeless and helpless. That's it for tonight. Thank you very much.